Welcome everyone to part four of our five part talking about Israel series. Today's session entitled War and Peace will be an outline of the history of conflict in the region with a focus on the concepts of violent and nonviolent protest, boycotts and the questions of deterrence. Uh, today we are lucky enough to have Sam Tataka who will be delivering uh, the fourth session. Sam has been, an active, uh, has been active in many community organizations over the years, including Orgis and Beit Haron at Mount Scopus. Uh, Sam has also served as the president of Zionism Victoria. Uh, and as a barrister by profession, Sam appears in the family court and the federal circuit court in complex property matters and practices in all areas of family law and de, jack, uh, de facto jurisdiction. Uh, so with that introduction, I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to Sam to take it away. Uh, so my life is conflict every day of the week, but uh, in any event, uh, good evening. Thank you for coming out on this cold and miserable um, night in Melbourne um, and uh, for joining us in Zionism Victoria on this talking about Israel uh, series of lectures. And tonight we're going to be talking about conflict, which um, unfortunately has uh, dogged Israel ever since uh, its declaration of independence. In fact, even before that. So specifically, I want to talk as um, or begin with this wonderfully iconic photo that that uh, um, absolutely symbolizes the sense of hope and triumph and awe really of the soldiers who were, who fought their way into the old city of Jerusalem in the last couple of days of the six day war. And even that particular exercise was an exercise that was uh, almost um, unpredicted as the war progressed. It was not Israel's intention to go to war with Jordan, but we'll come back to the 1967 war, or we'll get to the 1967 war in due course. Um, I want to start uh, really uh, with the, uh, the first slide, which is the War of Independence in 1948. Um, the, what's interesting about that picture that you see, again, an iconic picture of David Ben-Gurion, um, uh, declaring independence of the state of Israel um, on Hayyar or, or November, uh, I'm sorry, in May of 1948, is that it was preceded in November of 1947 by the UN vote on the partition of Palestine. Now, um, those of you who are familiar with uh, the history of, of the region will know that the land was called Palestine by Roman conquerors um, of Judea um, and uh, Samaria back in the um, very early uh, terms of the modern era. Um, they did so really as a screw you to the Jews who they had uh, um, won over or beaten into submission and as part of the destruction of what was then the, the Kingdom of Israel. Um, and so uh, the British came to mind Palestine in the aftermath of the um, of the First World War. They had indicated uh, through the Balfour Declaration that they were supportive of the establishment of a Jewish homeland, provided the rights of the existing inhabitants were respected. Um, the Jewish Yeshuv, the settlement, uh, which is now something of a dirty term, um, uh, took up that offer. But by, not, by November of 1947, and in the aftermath of the Second World War and the Shoah, and many Jewish refugees not having any place to go in the aftermath of the war. Um, in November 1947, the UN voted to partition what was then the British mandate, what was left of the British mandate of Palestine into two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. Um, the, um, the Arab state, as you will note, was not referred to as a Palestinian state. And in fact, the, the notion of Palestinian nationalism as an identity in and of itself was not to emerge for another 15 or so years post 1948. In any event, once the UN partition um, plan or a partition resolution had been passed, what essentially broke out um, in Israel, in modern day Israel, is a, a cold war or a limited, a limited cold war between Arab insurgents, many of them supported by the British and um, who, who had still not evacuated and the nascent army of Israel, which was at the time the Haganah, together with other forces such as the Yigurden, the Stern Gang and various other uh, paramilitary forces uh, run by um, by Jews seeking the independence of Israel. Now you'll see, let me just go back to that earlier slide, please, Joey, thank you. 
Um, the state of Israel at the time, as denoted by the partition plan, was a sliver along the coast with settlements in the center of Israel and the Negev. You can see the blue parts in the map. And upon the declaration of the state of Israel, a military coalition of Arab states known as the Arab League, Jordan, Syria, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Egypt, and Lebanon, uh, noting there that neither Saudi Arabia nor Iraq had a border with Israel at the time, or Palestine, invaded Israel with the goal of eliminating the newly created state and its people. Um, you will see the in, in red the major advances of, um, of the Arab League forces into what was uh, the nascent state of Israel. Um, and it, Israel was in fact attacked um, uh, Israel was in fact attacked from uh, all sides, from the south, from the, uh, from the east, and from the north. So um, you saw you see Lebanon coming in from the north, Syria coming in on its land border over the Golan Heights. Um, Iraqi forces came across as well, the Jordanians across their border, um, and the Egyptians coming up from the south. So with the exception of, with the, exception of the sea, there was not a there was not a uh, part of Israel that was not the subject of an attack between the 15th of May and the 10th of June 1948. Um, the Arab League promised the Palestinian people that they would be able to return to their homes once the war was over. Um, there is a debate among some historians the extent to which uh, large segments of the Palestinian population left of their own vol volition in anticipation of a getting out of the way of the armies that were coming to liberate them, and b on the promise that they would soon be able to return to take over the land that had been occupied by the Jews, because the aim of the game in 1948, and in fact, the aim of the game in 1967, and in 1973, uh, was ultimately to eliminate um, the state of Israel. So uh, those armies attacked. Um, thankfully, the Jews were unexpectedly victorious. Um, the army the armies, uh, or the army, the newly formed army of Israel, the, the um, Svagan al-Israel, Sahal, um, were uh, able to push back the invading armies. And at the end of the 1948 war, there was an armistice line formed in 1949. Now, the next slide will show you that armistice line and helpfully paints green the areas uh, that were still under um, Arab control, mostly in the eastern, central eastern part of um, central eastern part of Israel. You'll see at that point there was a very narrow, a very narrow waste to Israel joining the northern part to the southern part. And I think at its peak it was something like 12 kilometers, maybe slightly wider than 12 kilometers wide, and therefore always very vulnerable. Jerusalem itself was divided. And what became known as the Green Line, or is now known in common parlance as the 1967 lines, even though in fact they were the 1948 lines or 49 lines, was a green line drawn on a map. And hence the expression Green Line that many of you may have heard over the years. It was literally, they took a texter, they outlined on a map um, where the Israeli forces and the Arab forces had stopped fighting. And that became the, the de facto border between um, Israel and the Arab, Arab countries surrounding it between 1949 and 1967. Um, it's important to know that that was not a peaceful border throughout that inter intervening period. Uh, in fact, there were regular um, attacks on Israeli settlements by Fedayeen from Jordan and from Egypt. Uh, and from Gaza, um, Israeli settlements and kibbutzim were constantly being bombarded from Syria, from the Golan Heights into, into the Jordan Valley. Um, Israelis, um, Jews, Arabs, Christians were indiscriminately being killed uh, by Arabs um, wherever they were seen um, and often by weapons that were simply fired with the aim of mass destruction to the extent that those weapons were capable of that activity uh, at the time. And I said it wasn't a, it was not a, um, a, 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 a warm piece. In fact, it was a very cold piece. And uh, the Egyptians uh, provoked another military action only seven years later in 1956. Next slide, please, Joey. 
Um, by the way, folks, if you want to send in questions, please feel free to do so on the Zoom chat and Joey will moderate them and I'm happy to pick them up at the end or if they're necessary on the way through, if anything um, is unclear. So in 1956, there was a commonality of interest between Israel, the French and the British because um, the Egyptians in an act of nationalism, the then president Abdul Gamal Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal, which had previously been owned by Britain and France or at least British and French interests and he cut off the shipping route to Israeli ships. And then with the support of Britain and France, primarily at the instigation of Britain and France, Egypt, uh, Israel invaded the Sinai Desert in order to seize control of the Suez Canal. Britain and France supported the war to prevent Nasser from seizing control of the canal and blocking it, which was a crucial shipping canal. Um, Israeli, French and British terror troops dropped behind enemy lines and took control of the banks of the canal. And as became common practice in wars to come, uh, the, uh, the US and the USSR ordered a ceasefire um, and arranged for Israeli, British and French forces to withdraw on the basis that the canal would remain open and a UN peacekeeping force would take control of the canal, ensuring that Israel had freedom of navigation through the canal. Uh, what then began was essentially a um, war of attrition that carried on, or it's not the war of attrition, but again, not a peaceful border on the south not a peaceful border to Israel's east because Jordan was still um, sending um, terrorist brigades over into Israel, certainly not peace in Jerusalem. And for those of you who have had the, the delight of visiting Jerusalem and walking its streets, if you walk the streets that are outside the old city walls and see some of the old buildings there, it's still possible to observe bullet holes um, in those walls, many of which were as the result of Jordanian snipers sitting on the top of the the old city walls and taking pot shots at Israelis going about their business um, on the western side of the city. So even, even uh, in Jerusalem itself, which remained divided until 1967, uh, you weren't peacefully able to go about your business in the areas that were close to um, areas occupied by the Jordanians and the Jordanian Legion. Um, could I also, in a footnote here, say that between 1940 eight or 1949, the war in 1948, the armistice in 1949, and the victory in 1967 that Israel uh, pulled out of a hat, uh, there was no attempt by any of these, um, any of the Arab countries or any members of the Arab League to establish a, an Arab body, body politic, an independent Arab body, body politic representing the interests of uh, the people that now refer to themselves as Palestinians um, within the land that they control. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, even though the Jordanian um, the Jordanians held a significant chunk of what the of what the Palestinians today claim to be the future of their Palestinian state, the Jordanians were completely disinterested um, in providing any political independence. Um, or authority to their um, Palestinian brothers living um, in uh, Israel under Jordanian occupation, effectively under Jordanian occupation at the time. So the opportunity was there to uh, release them, but that opportunity never arose. Uh, the important thing to understand, I think, in terms of the general sense of what was going on in the world at the time. Uh, was that Israel was very much perceived as the David that had overcome the Goliath. There was a sense of triumphalism within Israel. There was a sense of Israel's um, superiority and world opinion, generally speaking, was very much um, favorable towards Israel um, and the Jews in the period leading up to the 1967 war. Uh, our modern day experience of uh, world public opinion um, is very different and Israel has shifted from being the David to the Goliath, whereas the Palestinians have shifted or the Arabs have shifted from being um, the Goliath to being the, the victim um, David. In any event, uh, Nasser was an Egyptian nationalist. He was a pan-Arabist, i.e. he believed in the unity of Arab, uh, uh, the Arab people. He was very keen and um, to assert or reassert um, Arab dominance over the area and to right the very much perceived wrong of the 1948-49 War of Independence 
and basically, again, attempt to wipe Israel off the map as soon as he possibly could. Um, to that end, he um, built, again, a very significant um, military, um, marshaled forces, including a very large air force that was significantly uh, superior in terms of uh, aircraft and uh, munitions to the Israeli Air Force at the time, um, ready to attack. And uh, all signs of the drums of war beating loudly were there, including incendiary speeches and massive military parades um, in Egypt, in which Nasser promised once again to throw the Jews of Israel into the sea. Um, it's again, I think, of note that the Israelis were very fearful in the lead up to the 1967 war. There was a great fear of mass casualties. Um, and there was a very careful calculation done in Israel at the time as to whether or not a preemptive strike was something that they could successfully um, carry out in order to try and even the military balance of power um, in what was increasingly obviously going to be a significant attack by Egypt on its southern border. At that time, um, Israel was receiving some intelligence that suggested that Jordan wasn't a keen partner. Jordan's King Hussein was under tremendous pressure by Nasser to join in. He was assured by Nasser, um, and I'll come back to the, the course of the 1967 war in a couple of minutes, but he was certainly cajoled and assured by Nasser that he would have the opportunity to right the wrongs of the 1967 war and emerge, right the wrongs of the 1956 war, I should say, and emerge triumphant. Uh, could we have the next slide, please, Joey? Um, thank you. What's, what's interesting about the two cartoons that you see there is the classic anti-Semitic tropes, um, the cl classic anti-Semitic um, imagery drawn about um, Israelis at the time or Israel at the time, uh, long hook-nosed Jews um, uh, being kicked out of the land. That's the second cartoon is a larger cartoon of Nasser um, and him kicking the Jews out of the land. You can see kicking them into the sea, literally. Um, and in the first, uh, the first cartoon, you can see how the Jews are strangling the Arabs using, or the, the Arabs, I should say, are strangling the Jews in Israel by basically drawing a, a noose around their neck made up of the Star of David being the, the state symbol of Israel on its flag. Um, the, cart the, the depiction on the right is very much more triumphant. Uh, I'll tell you a very interesting anecdote. Uh, many, many years ago, my family flew to Sydney and we got into a taxi at Sydney Airport, as you do, or when you could fly to Sydney without border permits. Um, we um, uh, flew to Sydney, got into a cab, and our cab driver uh, started talking to us. And it turned out that he had been in the Egyptian Air Force in 1967. Um, and had been the subject of um, the Israeli attack at an Air Force base in Egypt on the first day of the war um, in 1967. Um, his, uh, his, uh, the conversation was really interesting. It was completely without rancor. It was done um, in, in a historic context um, and in the context really of Egypt and Israel having reached a peace agreement many years later. Uh, but so it was a, nevertheless a fascinating insight into how he saw the war and its impact. Um, he was absolutely confirmatory of the fact that the Egyptians were hours away from launching their own airstrikes against Israel when Israel caught the Egyptian Air Force on the ground and largely destroyed it. Um, and it was that preemptive attack um, on the Egyptian Air Force primarily that, that was the difference ultimately in Israel being in a position to win that war or ultimately being defeated because the force of arms and the force of numbers were that if the Egyptian Air Force had gotten into the air, um, there was little prospect, short of a miracle, of which we are no strangers, but there was little prospect of um, Israel being able to successfully take down sufficient numbers of, uh, of Egyptian aircraft so as to be able to provide air cover for Israeli ground forces um, that were seeking to uh, defend Israel. Um, and 
in our next slide, you will see, um, again, some evidence of the old city. Thank you, Joey. Um, so very quickly, the war ended, but it, what was very interesting is that the Egyptian campaign was won very, very quickly after the war began, but Nasser, uh, it's since been, re remember this was in an era before, before iPhones, computers, internet, and everybody holding a camera up showing the world what was really going on. And NASA was essentially able to dupe um, uh, Jordan's Hussein into joining the war by telling him stories about how well the Egyptian army was going when in fact the Egyptian army was on the verge of defeat. So Jordan had been sent messages by Israel basically asking it to stay out of the war and being told by Israel that if they did stay out of the war, Israel would take no action to retake any of the territory in the West Bank, i.e. Israel was prepared to retain the 1949 armistice line, the green line, so far as it pertained to Jordan, if Jordan stayed out of the war. Um, Hussein made a really dumb decision, really good for us in the end, but a really dumb decision because he made the decision to join the war, uh, which he did. Now you'll see, uh, you can see on the war, on the uh, on the gate, which I'm pretty sure is the Zion Gate being depicted there, um, is completely pockmarked with bullets. The, 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 the alleyways of the old city were a very heavy battlefield. It was house to house fighting essentially for the paratroops that went into the old city. But that part of the war didn't begin really until day four. So if you think about this in the context of what was going on, days one and two were essentially defeating the Egyptian army in the Sinai Peninsula. When that was done by day three, um, Israel's attention turned to what was then the growing Jordanian unrest and the Syrian uh, attacks and, Le and Lebanese attacks on the, uh, on the northern border or northeastern border. And therefore the Golan Heights was taken, but the, the war in Jerusalem was really the last two days of a six day war. Quite extraordinary in terms of the, the amount of ground recovered by Israel or, or conquered by Israel or taken by Israel in a defensive war, which is what really underpins the legal argument uh, still being waged today about whether the territory taken by Israel during that war was disputed, is disputed territory or occupied territory as the Palestinians and their supporters would have you believe um, or would, would have the world accept as being the case. Um, the Jerusalem campaign, which resulted in the idea of taking, uh, was uh, fought their way from Ammunition Hill, broke through the old city walls under heavy sniper fire, fought through the alleyways, as I said, and managed to reach the Kotel, which brought us that absolutely um, iconic photo with which I started um, this lecture or, or talk. Um, what's also interesting, and for those who note the, the differences, is the first broadcast of the Israeli paratroops from the old city um, was Har Habayit Be'adenu, which translates to the Temple Mount is in our hands. Uh, very shortly after that broadcast went out, and as a result of a political decision made by primarily by Defence Minister Moshe Dayan, but not on his own, he was the advocate for that decision. Um, the, 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 the broadcast changed to um, the Ir Hatika Biadainu, or the Kotel Biadainu. We've got the Kotel in our hands, i.e. there was very little and very short-lived triumphalism about the conquest of the Al-Aqsa Mosque um, about the Temple Mount and there in very short order an accommodation was made with the Jordanians whereby the Waqf, the Islamic religious authority, assumed control of the Temple Mount um, and its surrounds and that is the uh, control situation that ap applies even until today. The Waqf is in charge of the Temple Mount. Um, <clears throat> the situation in Israel at the end of the 1967 war, at the end of the 1960 war, 67 war, I'm sorry, was one of utter triumphalism and relief. Um, the feared um, annihilation was clearly not, had not happened. Uh, Israel was blessed with 
relatively few casualties in the war. It was done in a number of days. Um, significant territory, and in this case, territory that offered a military, a significant military advantage was taken. The Sinai Peninsula provided all of a sudden a significant buffer between Israel and Egypt because Israel was now in control of the peninsula. Um, the Gaza Strip uh, was in, under Israeli control. The whole of what was known as the West Bank, and again, for students of geography, you will know that it, the, the West Bank is in fact west of Jordan, but it's the east bank of the river from the, from the Israeli perspective. But for, com for common language purposes, let's continue to call it the West Bank. So Israel took the West Bank and the whole of Jerusalem. Uh, it took control of the Golan Heights and therefore provided a very significant military advantage in terms of defending the very fertile Jordan Valley and its settlements below, because no longer could Syrian artillery sit on top of the mountains of the Golan and lob bombs onto um, the Israelis below in the Jordanian, um, in the Jordanian uh, Valley, or in the Jordan Valley, I should say, which was the heartland of Israel's agriculture. Now, just prior to the 1967 war, you saw the beginnings of the Palestinian Liberation Organization led by Yasser Arafat, um, who was himself an Egyptian. Um, Arafat uh, galvanized um, Arab, um, Arabs living in Israel and began the, fo the formation of Palestinian um, identity as a separate national identity. Uh, it is clear that, um, that that is the commonly accepted narrative today, i.e. that there is, there, in fact, there is Arab, um, I'm sorry, a Palestinian national liberation movement, but that's, as I said earlier, not the way the story began um, in 1948 and through until 1967. Uh, again, knowing about the way in which um, perhaps uh, face was lost by the Arabs, you can imagine the sense of utter devastation amongst uh, the Egyptians um, in terms of, of Nasser's pan -Arab nationalism, pan-Arab nationalism, his promises of victory, the massive cost in men and materiel uh, that was uh, incurred by Egypt as a result of this campaign. In fact, an entire Egyptian army was taken prisoner by Israel, subsequently released, um, as was a significant um, Syrian force but the, at the end of the 1967 war and in the face of Israeli triumphalism, we need to understand that the Arab side of this equation were beaten soundly and with very great embarrassment. The result of that was in effect, um, that their anger seethed, their military buildup began afresh and they were looking for another opportunity to go to war with Israel in order to complete the mission that they had begun only 20 years earlier to try and throw um, the Israelis or the Jews into the sea. Um, and it is important that when they were talking at the time, they were not talking about throwing the Israelis into the sea, they were talking about throwing the Jews into the sea. The other thing that I think is, is worth mentioning is in the immediate aftermath of the 1967 war, um, Israel offered peace by back channel communication to the Arab League on the basis essentially of returning most of the conquered territory to where it had be belonged at the beginning of the 1967 war in return for peace agreements. Uh, the response of the Arab League in 1968 when they met in Khartoum was the famous three, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the famous three no's, no to negotiations, no to peace, and no to any dialogue with Israel. Essentially, they turned their backs um, on Israel and said, we're not interested. You won this, this battle. You haven't won the war. We're not interested in peace. We're not interested in talking to you. Uh, basically, we remain enemies. Um, and I think it is a common theme often forgotten today that Israel sought peace at every opportunity uh, from 1947 onwards, even though the borders drawn in the 1947 partition plan were very uh, tough in terms of defensible and economically sensible borders, 
um, Israel, the, the, the Jewish side, the Israeli side was prepared to accept um, the 1947 partition, the Arabs rejected it. In 1967, Israel was prepared to give land for peace. It was rejected by the Arab League. Um, and terrorism uh, uh, started to rear its head. And given that we are uh, now in the middle of the Tokyo Olympics, um, it is important for us to note that it was only five years after, four years after, five years after the 1967 war that the Munich Olympic terrorist attack occurred, um, killing 13 <coughs> Israeli athletes uh, in the Olympic village. And as a mark of um, the great respect of the Olympic movement and after 50 years or so of lobbying, there was a mealy mouthed uh, acknowledgement of the loss of the Israeli, um, Israeli uh, athletes at this year's opening ceremony. Um, you'll excuse me if I say that it was mealy mouthed. Um, in my view, they, they again missed an opportunity to right a wrong. Um, can I quote, can I quote from their, um, from the presentation, the speaker said, we, the Olympic community, also remember all the Olympians and members of our community who have so sadly left us. In particular, we remember those who lost their lives during the Olympic games. So far, no mention of Israel at all. And you'll notice lots of people who lost their lives during the Olympic games, but who, who exactly they were, I don't know. Then we get the operative part. One group still holds a strong place in all our memories and stands for all those we have lost at the games. The members of the Israeli delegation at the Olympic New Games, Munich 1972. So uh, as long as the Israelis represent everybody else lost at the games, we can kind of make some mention of them um, as long as they're part of the overall Olympic family. Um, I'm not personally aware of any other Olympians who were murdered as a result of their national identity in the course of the Olympics, but the Olympic movement essentially has turned its back on a proper acknowledgement of that horrendous outrage in 1972 for the best part of 50 years and managed to come up with that particular statement this year, um, for which some people are celebrating. Um, in any event, you can understand that the period between 1968 and 1970, uh, 1967, I should say, and 1973, was a period in which Israel uh, again felt under siege and the drums of war were always, uh, if not beating loudly, beating, beating quietly in the background. Uh, there's also a geopolitical shift going on at the time. Uh, the French, as at 1973, had decided that they were no longer going to be supplying arms um, and materiel to Israel. Um, Israel, through the first 20 odd years of its military existence, had relied very heavily on French arms and material, in particular French jets, uh, were the, the backbone of the Israeli Air Force, but the French decided that their oil interests in the Middle East outweighed their political interests with Israel and basically decided that they were gonna stop supplying Mirage fighters um, to Israel. Uh, America filled that gap um, in 1973 and uh, whatever one thinks of, of, of Richard Nixon, uh, Richard Nixon in fact saved Israel's um, um, saved Israel in 1973 by a massive airlift of arms and munitions in which uh, Israel was resupplied in the Yom Kippur War and without which they undoubtedly would have run out of uh, 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 material with which to fight that war very early on. Um, so 1973. Next slide, please, Joey. Um, the, the prelude, as I, I've just gone through, I'm sorry, I've, I've, got, I, I've pre empted the slide and perhaps we'll go straight to the next one. Um, so, uh, Nasser, thank you, Joe. Nasser is out at this point. Sadat is in. Sadat, uh, we, we remember now very, uh, very much as the peacemaker who met with Begin and, and signed a peace deal between Egypt and Israel, which ultimately cost him his life. But as at 1973, when he assumed power from uh, Nasser, his plan was to right the wrong of the 1967 war and to drive Israel into the sea. Um, and uh, the Prime Minister of, of Syria was forced out by Hafez al-Assad, the father of the current um, leader of Syria, who's managed to murder millions of his own people in the last decade or so. Um, 
And these two nations began preparing for a war to, war to settle back or seize back lost territory. Okay, Joey, thank you. Next, next one. <clears throat> That's dealt with the Munich Olympics. And, but notice there, Golda Meir. Now, Golda Meir was a central figure in the lead up to the 1960, 1973 war. And in fact, uh, was forced from office in its aftermath because she was heavily criticized in Israel for not being sufficiently prepared or ensuring that Israel was sufficiently prepared for the purposes of meeting what had um, become increasing numbers of, of alerts that the Egyptians um, and the Syrians were intent on taking back the territory that they had lost in the 67 war and were doing that with a massive military buildup. Now, for those of you who have lived through these wars, you will, there's a familiar pattern. Um, if Israel, uh, in 1967, when Israel began a war, they're always on a stop clock. There's always a time at which the world will step in and say, that's okay, you've gone far enough, you need to stop fighting. It, we, we saw it most recently in Gaza. We saw it in 19, we saw it in the last two Gaza conflicts. We've seen it in, um, in Lebanon. We've seen it in, um, in uh, the Yom Kippur War. We saw it in the 1967 war as well. Uh, at the point where Israel becomes too victorious, the war comes to a stop. And also Israel had to be very careful of its political relationship uh, with the United States in particular, because the geo geopolitics of the time were that the Arabs were under the, um, the influence of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union and the United States were implacable enemies in the 1960s. Uh, think the Cuba Missile Crisis in 1963. So the broad brush of geo world geopolitics at the time were Israel was an American ally in the Middle East and its only ally and probably still is today, only serious ally. I guess now there's the Saudis and others who are, who are at least um, in serious diplomatic relationships with the Americans. But um, in the 1960s, that was not the case. It was um, Israel on one end, the American side, and everybody else on the Russian side, on, on the Soviet Union side. Um, so Golda was very much um, hesitant about too much of a buildup on Israel's borders because she was very mindful of the fact that they would not, that Israel would not have an opportunity to launch a preemptive strike. In effect, her view was that Israel had to be the victim of Arab military aggression before Israel could, could mobilize properly in order to meet that threat. Uh, clearly, that was a misjudgment. Whether you judge Golda as being guilty of that misjudgment or, or paint the brush more broadly towards her cabinet, and in particular, perhaps the hubris of Moshe Dayan, at the time, having just fought the massive victory of the 1967 war, there was lots of, lots of hubris in Israel about how well they would do. And an interesting mark of that hubris that somebody described to me many years later was in the 1967, in the aftermath of the 67 war, the phrase uh, which some of you will know from the prayer of Hallel was um, Yisrael betach betzahal. Now, what that means is um, Israel has faith or relies upon Sahal, its army, in the 1967 war. And that is a paraphrase of the, of the psalm that says, Yisrael betach Hashem, that Israel relies on God, uh, has faith in God for its, um, its existence. But in 1967, the sense of hubris and, 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 um, and victory and, and um, triumphalism was such that uh, Israel's um, believed it to be Israel's um, government, many of, much of its army believed it was utterly invincible. Um, and unfortunately, that had a role to play in the 1973 uh, disaster, at least initial disaster, that was the Yom Kippur War. Now, uh, I was a child in 1973, in fact, 15 years old. I actually remember getting the late edition of the Herald Sun newspaper. Um, in shul during Yom Kippur, which gave, uh, which gave voice to what was going on, the very early reports of the attack, and how worried we all were uh, then and there about what was going on. But Yom Kippur morning, when most Israelis were in shul, um, Egypt attacked across the entire um, Suez Canal 
into the uh, Sinai Peninsula and uh, overran what was then the Bar Lev line, which was supposed to defend Israel against any, um, any uh, Egyptian incursion into the recently um, acquired Sinai Peninsula, which was supposed to be a buffer zone. Um, the Bar Lev line was undermanned. There was not sufficient troops there in any event. Um, and as experience would have, would have demonstrated from the Maginot line and other, other attempts to build implacable walls, including you know, stupid attempts on the Mexico border, if I might make that, uh, that wry observation, um, walls generally don't work and, and lines generally don't hold in terms of heavily fortified lines because the Egyptians managed to overrun the Bar Lev line on the first day of the war. And there were massive, um, massive um, casualties on the Israeli side, including a, a Melbourne resident um, by the name of Marvin Pakula, a cousin of our current minister for racing and lots of other things. Um, but Marvin Pakula was a graduate of Yeshiva College who went to Israel, made Aliyah, found himself in the Israeli army, found himself on the Suez Canal on Yom Kippur and was killed in the first, um, uh, first push by the Egyptians across the border. Uh, Ariel Sharon was the hero of the Sinai campaign, uh, managed to mount a, a massive counterattack in which he basically encircled, crossed over the Suez Canal, encircled the Egyptian third army and cut off their supply lines. And that was done uh, within three days of the commencement of the war, uh, because they were able to um, take uh, take that tremendous victory, uh, they snatched victory from the jaws of defeat, really, um, in the Sinai Peninsula, basically by the eighth uh, by the eighth of October. I'm sorry, I take that back. By the tenth of October, <laughs> I'm sorry, my dates are slightly off. Um, so uh, there. There were attempts to push the Egyptians back initially. It took a few days until Israel could gather its forces. They did, in fact, manage to gather the forces, surround, um, surround the Egyptians and cut them off. Uh, okay. At the same time, on the Golan Heights, there were uh, massive Syrian advances, huge tanks, uh, brigades of tanks crossing the Syrian uh, border into the Golan. Um, again, Israel, Israelis were forced to fight um, as they were being pushed down the mountain by the Syrians. Uh, the Jordanians had crossed over um, into uh, uh, on their side of, of, of on the West Bank. Uh, it was a massive um, problem and Israel was losing soldiers at a horrifying rate and was also burning through uh, its tanks and other material at an alarming rate such that it was face ultimately of running out of bullets to fight with, even if it had the army with which to fight. Uh, next slide, please. And again, I'm sorry, I'm showing you the slide after I'm giving you, uh, giving you the information. One more, Joey, let's go to continue, please. Uh, you'll see that Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Oman tried to help um, through uh, break through the Israeli lines. Uh, the Northern Front was secured. Um, so they were able to make sure that that wasn't happening. And then the Israelis could focus on pushing the Egyptian forces from the Sinai because the Northern Front was in fact, I, I, I was only to correct what I said earlier, the Northern Front was far more vulnerable. The Sinai Peninsula provided, as it was intended to, a buffer zone, but there was virtually no buffer zone on the, on the Golan Heights. So Israel had to throw lots of troops into there to stop effectively the Syrians splitting Israel in half. Um, once the Northern Front was secure, the Israelis could, could push down into, into the Egyptian forces from the Sinai. The Egyptians held the entire coast along the Suez Canal. The Israelis um, uh, devised this strategy to come across the canal and separate the army off from its supply lines. And the Battle of uh, Chinese Farm, as the area used to be a Chinese settlement in Israel. And by the 17th of October, some nine days or 10 days after the beginning of the war, the Egyptian troops were surrounded the Syrians were ineffective and the battle was won by the Israelis. <clears throat> At tremendous cost, there was a huge cost to Israel, not only in terms of lives lost, and you'll see that in the next slide, please, Joey. 
More than 3,000 soldiers were killed. Um, in, his, in per capita terms, that's near enough to the number of soldiers that the Americans lost in the whole of, whole of World War II. Tremendous casualties in per capita terms. Um, 8,000 were injured, 500 were captured, and many of those captured uh, were tortured but not, and not returned to Israel for many years after. Um, a, a commission of inquiry was formed in Israel uh, to look into it, and you'll see the top slide is actually Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan visiting with the Israeli troops on the Golan Heights. For those of you who haven't seen it, can I highly recommend the documentary Golda, which tells the story from Golda's perspective. Um, it relates the criticisms of her and gives her an opportunity to voice um, her um, view of how things happened and, and her personal sense of responsibility. So I highly recommend that, uh, that uh, documentary, which if I'm correct, not mistaken, is on, available on Netflix. Um, uh, the report that, that Israel um, uh, commissioned technically cleared Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan, although they were both they both resigned, um, and Yitzhak Rabin became prime minister at the time. The Egyptians also suffered heavy casualties, 20,000 dead, over 10,000 captured. Nevertheless, they managed to sell this as something of a victory because they had uh, ca caused such a heavy toll um, on Israel. But they reversed the humiliation of the six-day felt that they could then negotiate as equals. So although the 1967 war had a, the 1973 war, I should say, had a terrible price, um, it ultimately led to Sadat being in a position where he had regained sufficient face to be able to um, enter into the Camp David Accords uh, that, that were, I'm sorry, firstly, the peace meeting between Sadat when he visited, when he visited Israel, uh, and then ultimately, the Camp David Accords uh, that led to a peace treaty uh, that lasts until today. You'll see in that picture the most unlikely site of Menachem Begin, who was always demonized as a warmonger and a terrorist, um, and Anwar Sadat, who had run this campaign of, of intended annihilation against Israel only a few years after the war, um, being in a position to um, come together and shake hands in what was the beginning of a lasting peace accord. Uh, the next slide, please, Joey. Joey? Hello. Thank you. Um, right. Uh, post Camp David, the deal was that Israel would return Sinai to Egypt in exchange for peace. Israel and spoke in the Knesset, that is also, also wonderfully portrayed. Is the documentary, hello, um, the documentary uh, of the Prime Ministers, which is um, uh, Yehuda Avner's book, which has been turned into a documentary, which is also well worth uh, seeing because of his insights into five separate Prime Ministers who he served, including the, the very interesting periods through which he served, which include the uh, 1967 war and the 1973 war and the peace treaty with Egypt. Fascinating documentary, which I again highly recommend. Um, Sadat was assassinated straight after, very shortly after uh, the Camp David Accords and largely um, because of his willingness to make peace. Okay. Um, that fundamentally is the end of um, Israel's major inter uh, intra-state or state actor parties wars. Um, we now come to the Lebanon War of 1982, Operation Shalom La Hagalil, which was the operation conducted under uh, Sharon's leadership to drive out um, Arafat and the PLO from particularly the northern border of Israel with Lebanon, where they were staging terrorist attacks into Israel at, at terrible cost, including uh, children on a bus, um, kibbutzim, ma'alot. There were so many horrifying massacres conducted by terrorists infiltrating from the northern border. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a military operation was staged essentially to clear the southern border of, 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 or the border, the northern border of Israel, the southern border of, of Lebanon in order to create a demilitarized zone so that 
um, there could be a cessation of hostilities impacting Israel's northern population. Uh, that began in, in June of 1982, uh, when Israel's ambassador to England was shot by PLO terrorists. Uh, two days later, Israeli, Israel used that, um, that, that murder as a reason to invade and attack the PLO. And the operation's purpose, stated purpose was to push the PLO out of Lebanon and install a peaceful government. Regrettably, Lebanon is still in the thrall of terrorist organizations, although nowadays it's Hezbollah and not the PLO. Um, one of the big questions um, that Sharon dogged Sharon for the rest of his life was his decision to push into Beirut, which he undoubtedly did. Um, and with that action, um, the war became something quite different to what it was intended to do. It became a, a battle against guerrilla forces in urban cities with the high price in lives uh, that that took, <clears throat> noting also that Israel's armed forces until this time had been primarily engaged in, um, in traditional military campaigns, army versus army, rather than army versus uh, guerrilla forces. Although, of course, there were ter terrorist activities and special Israeli army units, but the army was primarily geared for state actor hostility. Um, Israel lost, um, there was a massive loss of morale as the war in, in Lebanon um, dragged on. Uh, Israeli soldiers were casualties on a regular basis in the fighting, that was, the guerrilla fighting that was involved. There was a terrible massacre in two Palestinian refugee camps, uh, Shatila and Sabra. Um, Sharon ultimately bore, uh, was, was um, held responsible for not preventing that attack. Um, although to suggest that it was Israel that actively was engaged in that attack is just a, a not an accurate read of history. Um, it was nevertheless carried out when Israel was in control of the area and um, allowed um, factions of, of, of Lebanon's Christian militia to, um, to run riot um, in those two camps with undoubtedly some innocents uh, being killed uh, for no reason uh, that could possibly advance um, Israel's interests. <clears throat> uh, Arafat was given an opportunity, a brokered opportunity to leave um, Lebanon, which he took, and the PLO and Arafat essentially relocated to Tunisia um, and there re-established itself. Okay, in 2006, which is the next slide, please, Joey. At the end of the, at the, end of the 1982 war, um, uh, Israel ultimately withdrew, left the South, South Lebanese, um, Southern Lebanese army in charge of a buffer zone of about 40 kilometers in the South of Lebanon. They were allies of Israel and basically provided a buffer between um, uh, the Lebanese army in the North and the um, Israeli border in the South of, of them. Um, but on July 12, 2006, Hezbollah conducted a raid um, over the Israeli border and captured <coughs> Ehud Goldwasser and Eldad Regev, Regev, I should say, and almost certainly killed them in the process of that capture, if not seriously wounded them. But Israel, um, as it was wont to do, mounted a rescue mission, which turned into um, the Second Lebanon War of 2006, where Israel essentially started off trying to retrieve these kidnapped soldiers, but ended up going much further into Lebanon and trying to exact a military price against Hezbollah. There was 34 days of war. Hezbollah fired 4,000 rockets, uh, reminiscent of what's going on from Gaza just a few months ago. Um, uh, it killed 165 Israelis, wounded 2,700 others. A million Israelis were displaced. Um, many suffered post-traumatic stress as a result of, of living their lives in bomb shelters while bombs unguided missiles essentially rained down on Israeli cities. Uh, Haifa itself uh, was the victim of attacks um, and the war ended essentially with a ceasefire brokered by the Lebanese government and the UN um, and the soldiers were much later, the bodies of those soldiers were much later um, repatriated to Israel for, for burial. Um, now, as much as one wants to say about Ariel Sharon, um, in 2006, uh, next slide please, Um, he took, at the time, an incredibly un, 
predictable step by a right-wing leader in Israel, essentially um, deciding that Israel was no longer going to attempt to control the Gaza population from within. It was relinquishing um, its military um, control of Gaza and moving not only uh, the military out of Gaza, but several thousand Israeli families who had taken up residence um, in Gaza since the, excuse me, since the 1967 uh, war. Um, Sharon basically said, here's, here's an idea, land for peace. You don't want us occupying you. Here is all of the Gaza Strip, it's yours. Now, critics today say, oh yes, but it wasn't really a land for peace deal. It was primarily um, an exercise in um, uh, uh, creating a, a prison outside of Gaza. Um, I beg to differ with them. Um, the, the immediate response was, even though greenhouses and all sorts of things were left there upon which a Gazan economy could have been built, these things were all destroyed. No vestige of the Jewish settlements remains. In fact, not only did Israel take all of the living settlers out of Gaza, they took all of the bodies of Jews who had died in Gaza with them so that there was not a single trace of, of, of a Jew anywhere in Gaza from 2006. Uh, regrettably, what that led to was um, the Palestinian population of Gaza electing Hamas as its government. Um, and that started a chain reaction which leads to a string of conflicts which go on until this day. Um, I might shortcut through these Gaza operations because they essentially and sadly appear to be repeats of each other. Um, the uh, uh, 2006 Gaza conflict was uh, predicated by, uh, again, the kidnap of an Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit, who was only married earlier this year, Mazal Tov Gilad, um, who's managed to reconstruct um, his own life in Israel after terrible years in captivity in Gaza. Um, they kidnapped Shalit. They uh, were firing rockets into Israel, which you can see in, in the slide uh, that has all of those uh, missiles and bombs that have been fired into Gaza, which sits um, in um, Sderot. So if you visit Sderot, that rack is available to you to see. Um, approximately 750 rockets have been fired into Israel following the disengagement. Israel began a military operation. Unfortunately, uh, Gilad was not recovered during that operation, uh, the rocket attacks continued. And that led to uh, Israeli uh, invention of the Iron Dome defense shield, which proved so effective in the last um, Gaza shooting war. Um, the next slide, Joey, Operation Cast Lead. Again, uh, rockets fired by Hamas continued after the, fire, after the ceasefire in 2006, constant threat to the entire south of Israel, particularly Sterot and Beersheba. Hamas started its massive tunneling operations. Um, Israel carried a number of airstrikes from time to time targeting, targeting Hamas bases. Um, and <clears throat> then uh, a terrorist attack occurred um, in, um, in the Gush and three Israeli teenagers were kidnapped and killed. Uh, Eyal Yifrach, Gilad Shahar and Naftali Frankel, Zichronam Livracha, were killed, uh, were mur kidnapped, murdered and buried. Uh, that led to um, the second, uh, second Gaza war, Operation Cast Lead 2008. 1,500 Palestinians were killed in that conflict um, of which reasonable estimates are at least half were Hamas combatants. Um, next slide, please. 2014. Uh, more rocket attacks, more kidnappings. Um, correct, I'm sorry, thank you, Maya Gutman, you're quite right, that slide was, mis was, was misplaced. Um, the Israeli teenagers that are pictured in the bottom of the cast lead um, slide that we just went, went past were not kidnapped then, they were kidnapped in 2014, and that's what led to the operation in 2014. Thank you for that correction, and I'll make sure the slides are updated for the next talk. Um, in response to more rocket attacks, the kidnapping and murder of these three Israeli teenagers, Israel invaded Gaza in, in July of 2014. The goal again was to eliminate terrorist leaders, stop the ro rocket attacks and destroy the terror tunnels. Um, the war came to an end after 50 days of conflict when a ceasefire was arranged. Hundreds of civilians were killed, but also 
many um, terrorist, um, in, much terrorist infrastructure was demolished. 33 Ham Hamas tunnels, um, approximately 70% of Hamas's uh, rocket arsenal and approximately 1,600 Hamas fighters were killed. But in addition, hundreds of, um, of innocent Palestinians were also killed. And I must say that um, uh, the, the, I have no problem with the concept of um, many, many innocent Palestinians being caught up in a war in which they have little say and uh, little capacity to do anything about. Um, Gaza is a classic example of where human shields are being used, uh, many of them unwillingly and unwittingly, and many of them simply unable to make any choices other than, other than to continue to do the best they can for their families as they continue to live under the rule of terrorists. Um, it's important to, to note that there was yet another Gaza conflict, not dissimilar to the current conflict, but this time under the, under the uh, uh, fig leaf of uh, protests in support of a private land dispute in Sheikh Jarrah, which is a neighborhood of uh, Jerusalem in which uh, Israeli courts after many years of battles um, reached a conclusion that uh, certain families are unable to continue to remain in the homes that they have been leasing but not paying rent on for a number of years. Um, but land that clearly belonged to Jews who had bought that land well before the formation of the state and who could, could establish title to that land. Peace on the horizon. <laughs> Excuse me. A great big blank slate. Um, I don't see peace on the horizon. Um, others more hopeful than me may see something else. Um, on a micro level, there is indeed some work towards peace, but I think it's the micro level where you can see you know, very, very new green shoots. Um, the Abraham Accords have been amazing in the last um, couple of years in terms of uh, bridging gaps between um, Israel and its Arab neighbors. There is diplomatic relations now with the UAE. Um, it's Israeli's almost favorite tourist destination uh, at the moment. Um, uh, particularly uh, in view of direct flights by El Al and Etihad. I can tell you that my son is going to be flying on the Etihad flight via Abu Dhabi to Israel um, in a couple of weeks to start his year in Yeshiva. So there are definitely signs of um, a break in the Arab unity that was the subject of the Khartoum three nose now 50 odd years ago, 55 years ago, um, that, that gives reason for hope. Um, however, I, I qualify that by those things are really state actors um, in which state actors are pursuing their own economic um, and uh, uh, geopolitical interests. Uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend to some extent, uh, with Iran being a significant threat uh, in, the, in the region and Israel being seen as a significant bulwark against, against Iran. Uh, that is a, a big driver, in my view, of the recent progress made um, in peace deals with um, Arabs, Arab nations not bordering on Israel. Uh, there is a peace treaty in effect with Jordan. Excuse me. Um, Syria is elusive, but Syria is a political um, and social and economic basket case and a tragedy in the observation every day of the week as thousands of Syrians continue to suffer under the tyrannical uh, dictatorship of, of Assad. Um, Lebanon still hasn't been able to extract itself from Hezbollah's control. Uh, again, Hezbollah is sponsored to a large extent by Iran and receives arms and munitions across land uh, that is controlled by Islamic State and others. So there is a significant barrier to a peace, a lasting peace in my view, that will see Israelis and their Arab neighbors um, and, their, um, and their Palestinian neighbors being able to live together in, a, in peaceful coexistence. Um, my view is that the more uh, person to person and organization to organization contacts that can be built um, within, uh, within Israel um, and between Israel and the Palestinians and those who want to see an actual Palestinian state ar arise 
um, in part of Yehuda and Shamron. Um, the way that that's going to happen, the only way that's going to happen, I should say, in Gaza, the only way that's going to happen is if, um, if peace builds from the ground up. I can't see on any basis a Palestinian leadership, either currently or on the horizon, that has the um, capacity, uh, the audacity, if you like, to start speaking truth to their own populations about what's achievable in any deal with Israel. Um, Palestine will never be free from the river to the sea, no matter how many times that stupid thing is chanted, uh, because Israel's not going anywhere. Um, when they start talking about establishing a Palestinian state in peaceful coexistence with Israel, when that message is spoken out loud in Arabic um, to uh, Palestinians living in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, when that message is led by people of goodwill on the Palestinian side who can do so without fear of being um, killed or, or punished for their views, then there may well be a, a, a real peace between um, Egypt, uh, between Israel uh, um, and all of its um, Arab neighbours in the region. Um, I think that's probably as much as I want to say, and I invite you to ask questions. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I was asked by, and I'm happy to, um, direct your attention to a very interesting documentary uh, that, that David Fulberg of um, Israel Connection has just posted online. Um, it's a debate which can be found on YouTube by searching hashtag Israel Connection, C-O-N-N-E-X-I-O-N, -E about the impending Sheikh Jarrah evictions and home demolitions. It's a debate between a Palestinian representative and, a, um, and an, Isra an Israeli representative about the, the competing interests in Sheikh Jarrah. So if you'd like to get some more information about that, you're more than welcome to log on. There's also 24 other independently produced videos that you can see there. Um, thank you. Right. Cool. Uh, well, thank you for that. We've got a few questions. Um, I know that we're running a bit long time, so I might just leave us with about 10 minutes um, for these questions. Uh, so starting off, why did you choose to start with the 1947, uh, with 1947? Could you comment on the conflict with the British? I'm sorry, with the? Uh, with the conflict with the British. Uh, because I think, I, I think to see Israel in its, in its proper context, um, the, 1940s, the, 19, the, the war of independence was not fought um, evenly, if you like. The, 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 the British geopolitics had shifted from their support of uh, the Balfour Declaration to being quite anti-Israel's anti establishment. Um, they, supplied, um, they supplied arms and material to the Fedayeen, the, the, the forerunners of the terrorists. They abandoned strategic forts um, and allowed them to be taken by Arabs, which, which cost many lives in, this, in, in the War of Independence. Um, I don't think they left Israel with clean hands. And I think they bear a significant amount of responsibility for um, the, immediate, the immediate war and its aftermath leading to the 1967 war. Um, so a lot of people looked at 1967 and Israel's preemptive strike on the Egyptian Air Force as unjust, but many also failed to understand just what Israel was up against. Could you maybe again touch on just what Israel was threatened by in that period? Okay. So both in terms of tanks, planes, armies, munitions, in all of those categories, Israel was significantly outgunned. And there was no question about that. They had intelligence that the, Egypt, the Egyptian army was two or three times the size of the entire Israeli army. On top of that, you had the Syrian army, the threat from the, the Western border for Jordan. Um, Israel was really faced with a nihilistic attack, um, which if it had succeeded, would have the, the, the Syrians would have cut Israel's north from its south. The Egyptians would have taken the south. The Syrians would have taken the north. The Lebanese would have piled on as well. Um, and there was no question that if that military preemptive strike had not occurred, um, Israel would have been horribly outgunned in what was an intentional war of annihilation. So if you know that somebody is coming down your driveway with a with a gun, ready to kill you and your family. I see nothing wrong with firing onto the common property, if you like, <laughs> in order to protect yourself before they manage to get into your place. 
Um, we've got another question here about your uh, David versus Goliath analogy. Um, so could it, couldn't it be said that it's not exactly accurate due to Israel receiving Western support uh, and that the Palestinians never really had an official unified military capability? Um, yes, if you look, I think that's not an unfair comment, uh, provided you are now focused in a post-1967 in a post-1967 um, environment. It's impossible, in my view, to describe fairness, if you like, vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians pre-1967, because largely the, war, the wars that Israel fought up until 1967 were state actor wars being fought by the Arab League against Israel. The, the, the notion of arming the Palestinian body politic is really something that developed much after the 1967 war in the context of to what extent would a, a nascent Palestinian state be entitled to be militarized. I don't think it has any real relevance to the period that we've had under discussion. And to the extent that the Palestinians have been able to arm themselves, um, albeit with the so-called homemade rockets versus Israel's sophisticated weaponry and all the sort of David, the, the, the nonsense of the slingshots of the of, of Hamas with their um, incendiary, incendiary balloons and, and home, homemade rockets um, without any guidance systems and all the rest of it somehow being at a disadvantage to Israel's highly technologically advanced capacity to seek out military targets without unnecessarily endangering civilians is a, is a misconceived comparison in my view. Um, Israel's obviously had to chop and change its dominant international relationships over the years. You noted the decision by Israel to eventually turn to the US instead of France and the UK. Uh, the state of this relationship is obviously very strong, um, but we've got a new president now. Do you think that that's going to continue? Um, uh, yes, I do. Um, and, I, and, and, I, and I will also say that I don't think Israel's relationships with the United States were poor in the period between 1947 or 48 and um, and 1967. The real key difference was that the French, the French military manufacturing um, machine was interested in selling arms to Israel and did sell arms to Israel and Israel was able to buy those arms and use them uh, with their own modifications. It was the French and the British who said no more. So Israel was looking for another supplier. Well, I don't think Israel made it made its own conscious choice to turn away from them. I think they. I think the factory door was closed. The boycotts. The, you know, the very beginnings of boycotts began, and that's the that's the end of it. Um, do you see a shift in the ongoing war aiming to delegitimize Israel to focus more on the use of IHRL, so international human rights laws? compared to IHL, International Humanitarian Law? <laughs> um, I, I find it hard to wrap my head around that particular question. Um, the, the, the wars against Israel being fought in the courts are fundamentally ha hamstrung by the power of the courts to do anything apart from making pious declarations about where they see the rights and wrongs of things. Um, do I think Israel has, a, has an international um, image problem amongst a very significant uh, proportion of the world's population, I think it definitely does. Do I think that that's a fair assessment of the way of the steps Israel has taken over time to try and make peace, demonstrably made peace, um, demonstrably surrendered land in aid of peace um, is just unfair, fundamentally. Um, so no, I don't think. Um, I think we'll finish with uh, this one. Um, obviously, people understand the role of politics, politicians, um, in the scheme of, let's say, everyday life. How large of a burden do you think the concept of war and conflict plays on Israeli politics? That's very interesting. Um, I think anybody familiar with Israeli society would understand the importance of military service in terms of defining structure, uh, social stratification. Um, it's a, it's, a de rigueur question in any job interview you have um, in Israel, any university interview you have in Israel, anything you do in Israel, what, what unit did you serve in? What was your job? How are you perceived by your peers? What was your ranking and rating in the army? So there's, there's a bifurcation, I think, in Israel in the sense that just about every Israeli politician has got a significant military career behind them and they bring 
their thinking, their military thinking into their day-to-day -day lives. Do I think it dominates their lives? Probably not. Do I think it dominates the politics of Israel? I think in terms of selling um, Israel's security to the Israeli street, it's very important for the Israeli street to perceive um, their leaders as being um, able to ensure Israel's security. But increasingly, in my view, um, the, the weight of particularly young opinion is driving um, the Israeli body politic to consider alternatives to just selling a message of might and security and start selling a message of future and hope and a, and a pathway or at least a perception of how, um, how things might change uh, by moving in a different direction vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and, and joining us for our fourth Talking That Israel session. Obviously to you, Sam, a big thank you for taking the time to share with us your knowledge and uh, sharing us an incredibly insightful presentation. Uh, as always, thank you to our Zionist Victoria sponsors, without whom none of this would be possible. This is just the fourth of five sessions. So we've got our last one happening next week on Tuesday, same time, 7.30 p.m. Uh, and the final session is going to be on media action. So uh, stay, stay tuned to our social media and our website for some uh, speaker announcements on that. And hopefully uh, see you all next week. Thank you again, Sam. And thanks everyone for joining us. And thank you all for your time. Have a good night.